everybody. I'm Chad Eckert. You can follow me on Twitter at Edina Real Chi. It's a tough one, according to Bagels. That's uh, Joe Idoni. You can follow follow him on the Twitter machine at Tour Picks. Simple Twitter there. That's a great Twitter name. And us, Preferred Lines. You're listening to the Preferred Lines podcast. It's rolling along despite some positive COVID tests. The tour is continuing into Michigan. Detroit's Rock City to the Rocket Mortgage Classic. And Joe, we've reached that point where the excitement of the tour returning could be wearing off just a little bit. And this field is a little weaker. It's not an all star game, it's just a regular old event. That's just okay, a though, regular right? old event, but uh, we're still ready to go. We're fired up. We're coming off back to back winners, looking for that three peat. Um, but before we get to that, we got a great guest today. That's right, dude. Let's just get right into our, our front nine guest. Here he is. Let's go. This week's guest on the front nine segment, he's verified. Uh, the owner and founder of Golf News Net, tremendous resource for all things golf related, a hell of a player himself, I hear. Uh, now on the tee, our guest this week, Mr. Ryan Ballingy. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it. We're going to kind of rapid fire questions at you back and forth. I'll ask one, Chad will ask one, and then uh, we'll get you out of here in time to make your tea time. That sound all right? That's beautiful. All right. Go ahead, Chad, whenever you're ready, buddy. Ryan, thanks for coming on, dude. Okay, you've been producing golf content for almost 20 years. We're relatively new. Obviously, this is fourth podcast, so like, uh, we got a ways to go to catch you, but Talk to us. How do you see golf media content evolving over the next five years now that gambling's kind of taken over the United States of America? How do you like this, this new role of gambling? Well, I, th I think it's great. I mean, I've been talking about betting odds and um, matchups and outrights for years. I mean, before uh, you know, the PASPA became, you know, was overturned by the Supreme Court. And I think it's opened up a whole new world of content for people. I think that's great. I think it makes it a lot more accessible for people. I think it's, I think sports betting is great for golf because I think it's the most bettable sport that there is. So my hope is that within the next five years, you know, it'll turn more people onto the game, at least watching week to week on the PGA tour and, you know, give them something to sweat. And maybe the people who are betting on Sundays on the NFL in the fall, they'll come and see us in the spring and summertime. Let's hope so. So, Ryan, I know you've worked for uh, Golf Channel and NBC Sports in the past. There's been some big news this week uh, circled around Golf Channel, and they've, they've gone through a bunch of layoffs and have done some uh, budget cuts as well. Talk to us about what that means to the average golf fan in our viewing experience. What's that going to mean in layman's terms over the next couple of years for us? From what I've been told, there's going to be a, a fundamental change at Golf Channel, and it's going to kind of be a more absorbed part of NBC Sports. Uh, NBC is very proud of that brand, and I, I was proud to work for that brand uh, when they brought me on and then joined the Golf Channel team when there was the, the merger between Comcast and NBC Universal. And I, I think ultimately, for the, the average fan, you're going to see less studio programming centered around golf. You know, you won't okay. see as much morning drive, you won't see as much golf central, but you'll still see live from the majors, you'll still see major championship coverage, you'll still see great PGA Tour coverage week in, week out, all the major tours. That won't change. It's just going to be the programming around it that's going to change. And I, that, that's not to diminish what's going to happen to hundreds of people who are going to lose their jobs as a result of this. And that's, that's a very sad thing. And that's unfortunately the nature of this world. But for the average golf fan, I, I don't see a whole lot changing in, in the way they consume golf. Ryan, oh, we're betting podcast here. You've been doing this a long time. Is there a stat that you go to? Do you look at course history? Are you a grass type guy? You look at those things. What's your main criteria each week for clicking? It's evolved over time. I mean, I used to be rely very heavily on course history. And then in the last couple of years, I started to kind of do my own modeling and trying to figure out what actually works. And it, it course history matters. I think it does matter. I, I, I don't think you can diminish it, but it, it's not nearly as important as I thought it was maybe a few years ago. The model that I do every week basically weights strokes gained, I think that tells you everything because every golfer is different, right? Abe answer gains strokes completely differently than Rory McIlroy, totally differently than Jordan Spieth, but they're all damn good players. And there's a reason for that. And so the strokes gained aggregate works for me. And then I, we've created something that I think other people have uh, 
worked with as well and, and maybe different names, but quality strokes gained is what we call it. Basically weighting strokes gained against the quality of your competition every week. So if you play a better schedule, then it's harder for you to gain strokes in the field. You play weaker competition, it's easier for you to gain strokes in the field. So we try to weight that accordingly and then bring in current form and, and course fit is kind of what we try to term it, but basically being a, a horse for course. And try to kind of amalgamate all that together and sit out something that looks like, uh, turns out most weeks, like the, the official World Golf Ranking. But, uh, you know, a couple changes here and there from guys that might click better on a certain course than not. And those are the things that I try to pick out for our, our members of guys that might buck the, the curve a little bit versus what you would expect. Okay, well, speaking of gains, let's talk the talk of the tour. Mr. Bryson DeChambeau, third place, sixth place, eighth place, the first three events. Is this the week he wins, Ryan? I mean, it's, I always feel bad trying to say someone's going to win, but <laughs> it sure feels like it's coming, right? I mean, he played, he overpowered Colonial. He tried and almost did overpower Harbor Town, two places that I did not think would, would be susceptible to that. He didn't even play that well at Travelers and still top 10. <laughs> so all he just needs is one good week where the putts go in and he's going to win. I mean, this is a golf course where he can do that. The penalties are a lot different on this course that even than last week. I mean, there's just less water in play. His distance, I mean, this is what, a 72, 7,300-yard course from the tips. That, that doesn't mean anything to him. This is a pitch and putt uh, with Donald Ross Green. So if he can just hit the right spots with his wedges, he's going to give himself a lot of chances. He's just got to see those putts go in. What about fatigue, though? Are you worried about the guys who've made the cut in all three of the events so far? Is that the problem for them? I mean, I think the data tells us that usually week three and week four, when you start to see that big precipitous drop in, in quality of play, uh, there just aren't that many Sung JMs out there who can do this week in and week out like a robot. But even he's, he looks a little fatigued, too. He, he didn't play too great the last two times out. So, I mean, I, I think you have to weigh that. But at this point, you got a, a weaker field than you had the first two. You have basically half the same number of top 50 players. But some of those guys may be a little bit fresh because it was hard for them to get into the first couple of events. So that brings up an interesting point. You got some fresh guys who can win on a course where Nate Lashley won out of nowhere. I, I mean, I think fatigue sets in. But for Bryson, I mean, he's been trying to train for this, right? He's been trying to gain all this weight and gain all this muscle so that by round 13 out of 16 in a row, he, he doesn't feel it. But uh, right. I, I, you got to think it's, it's got to weigh on you at some point, even just the mental fatigue of contending for three straight weeks. So one thing, you know, Ryan, I, I've been betting golf for 10 plus years now. One of the things I found interesting recently is this sort of expansion and uh, this idea of live betting being more readily available throughout the process, ongoing, basically Thursday to Sunday. Should that change how we make our betting card each week? Should we be betting less of the traditional card where, we, you know, everything's done on Wednesday night and use our eyeballs a little bit more throughout the tournament to try and watch and and gain a little advantage that way. I think my running theory on it right now is that you still want to put the, the bulk of your card in top 10s, top 20s matchups. Get some money out there on some outrights that you like that you think maybe fit in your model that'll give you some good value. And then just maybe set aside 10% of your budget, 20% of your budget for, for in-game play. I still think head-to-heads are the absolute best way to make money because if you can just exploit two or three good matchups every week and come out ahead in two of the three or three of the four, uh, you're, you're going to do pretty well for yourself. And then that leaves you some profit to be able to go mess around on some things that are more fun and, and offer a higher payoff. Right on, like the long shots. And that's what we love to do here. But also, do you go to the top of the board? We're not guys that reach to the top of the board. What's the number that you typically start and target on your betting card? On the PGA Tour, I think about like 20 to 1. And I want to look at somebody that's a top 50 player in the world playing pretty well or likes this course that for some reason is getting just, I mean, Webb a couple of weeks ago at, at Harbor Town's a classic example. Like how could you give that guy away at 28 to one or 30 to one? That's right. stupid. You should have hit it. If you didn't, I'm sorry. But, um, but I think if you're playing outrights, other than if you can kind of get those kind of things, you want to think about, you know, 50, 75, 80. I think that's the range I like to start thinking about. Because at least if you're going to put 10 bucks on somebody, you, you want that, that real payout. You don't want to put like five bucks down to win 45 on Bryson this week. That's, right. We can go play a couple of hands of blackjack and make that back. So 
I, if I want to, if I want to get that kind of sweat, I, I want something really worth it. Right. So I know Ryan, you're into a uh, golf course architecture coming from a, a sort of betting perspective. Does that matter who the course, I know we're on Donald Ross this week, but do you look at those sort of traits throughout his courses? You know, you've got Pete Dye, you've got these famous architects. Is that something you factor in week to week? I do. I mean, I don't have a metric for it. Uh, I think more than anything, it's just whether, I mean, it's, that's course for course. I think course architect is more than anything course for course. Like if you care about course history, I think it really comes down to how the golf course is designed because you can, you can break down a golf course by number of threes, fours, and fives, yardages on all of those, but it depends on how they look. It depends on the traps that architects try to set. And you know, on the PGA Tour schedule, you only get a couple of architects that you see all the time and you see sure. Pete Dye a lot. So if you like Pete Dye, you know, you start to think about a Jason Day, although, you know, not now because he's not as healthy and not playing as well. But, uh, you know, I think about Webb on Donald Ross tracks because he loves Greensboro so much. So that that naturally seems to extend, uh, you know, on a Ross course, maybe I think a little bit more about strokes gained on the approach, even though that's so huge every week anyway. Um, but because you got to hit those kind of turtle back nasty greens to give yourself chances to make putts for birdies and eagles. I mean, those, if you can't hit the green, Donald Ross greens, you're going to struggle. I think those are really the only two architects that I think most about because we don't see a lot of Reese Jones um, other than, you know, major championships. And so, you know, guys like Tillinghast or William Flynn, you only see those in special situations. And I don't think guys, you know, no, nothing against like Bobby Weed or, Ed Alt or, you know, random guys that I know about, but most people don't care about. They're pretty much indistinguishable to most people watching on TV and frankly to the players too. So I, I, the only architects I really care about are, are Ross and, and Pete Dye. Got it. Let's get into the names for the Rocket Mortgage Classic. This thing is fun, but it's not as filled with the names, the juicy names that we've seen the last couple of weeks. These fields are still good. They're not as great as they want. Now, do you have a name in the like – Upper 100 to 1 range that's poised to pop. Who do you like this week? I have not gone that deep yet. I, I went through kind of my top 25 last night just staying up late because knowing I was going to be traveling today. I, I mean, I, I've kind of liked what I've seen from Chris Kirk, obviously coming back and winning on the, the Corn Ferry. I think that's a huge leap for him. Chris Kirk is also an extremely streaky player, kind of like a Matt Every. Like if you – you get them one week, you, you better get them the next week. Uh, Scott Stallings is in that same range, too. Another guy who he rattles off like three top fives in a row, saves his year, and then misses like seven cuts in a row. So I, I'm trying to think about streaky players who played maybe pretty well last week, who I'm willing to look at this week. Um, even a Peter Uline interests me a lot because I, I think he's very similar in profile to um, – like a Nate Lashley kind of guy or even a Rory Sabatini, like guys who are kind of long and kind of okay and they could pop off, but um, I don't have anyone that I absolutely love in that range yet. What type of people do you target in your top 10, top 20 bets? Are you going to the top of the board knowing like Bryson's probably going to get a top 10, so I'm going to bet it even if it's bad odds? What are the odds that you look at in top 20 or top 10 bets? I love what I mean. I want those kind of be more sure things. I think about those more in the way I think of a matchup. Like if I can get a good matchup at plus one ten or minus one oh five, then we're. I mean, that's just just enough of an edge where I feel like I'm gonna like Bryson over Rory last week. I got Bryson at like plus one ten. It's like all right, you know, Rory's playing well, but his driver doesn't mean as much. So let's throw a little money on that, and that'll buy us some some profit. So I think about, you know, maybe anywhere from plus 200 to plus 1,000 on a top 10. I mean, I'm looking at guys who are in my top 30 in my model, and if somehow they're getting a juicy odd to, to get in the top 10, all right, I'll throw a little coin on that. Okay. It looks like we lost Joe, but that doesn't matter. We don't need Joe. Uh, I'll just ask his questions for him, and one of them is talking about a clutch gene, the ability to close out a tournament under pressure. Is that something that's learned? Or is that something that you just have to have? I think there are people who are innately able to understand pressure and deal with it. And there are people like me who just have to learn what your body does to you and what your brain does when you get in that situation. Like playing competitive <laughs> golf. Uh, I've won tournaments over the years and just absolutely fallen apart. 
and somehow get to the finish line. And I'm like, all right, well, why did I do that? Why, why was I great for the first 35 holes and the last one was an absolute mess? Like, what, why did that happen? So I think about guys like Harold Varner III, who is going to win big someday. But he's the kind of guy, apparently, that has to be in this spot three, four, five times before you realize, okay, this is what I need to do. This is what I need to slow down. Here's how I handle this. Phil Mickelson was the same way in the majors. I mean, he racked up top five finishes before apparently Ernie Els was the right guy to beat at Augusta. So um, I think it's a little bit of both. And then there are just some guys who are risk averse. They, they are perfectly happy finishing in the top five and not having to think about winning. So. Um, and then that doesn't mean they don't want to win, but I think they just feel more comfortable cashing a $250,000 check than a $1.7 million check. So, uh, everyone's a little different, I think. Okay. We got a couple more questions. My last one is who's your super sleeper long shot that we're going to laugh at right now, but then you'll, we'll thank you later. (laughs) Oh man. Um, I'm going to mess up his name so badly. Uh, okay. He's the kid out of uh, – he's the – Oh, the three, the three gala? Is it the yes. <laughs> That kid is going to be really good. Uh, I mean, he destroyed the amateur ranks, destroyed collegiate golf. Um, I don't know what he's at right now. I guess 300. But mm-hmm. that kid's going to be really, really good. All right, I got one more for you, Ryan. Sorry I dropped out there. My phone crapped out on me for a second, but <laughs> – uh, before we get you out of here, this is the Preferred Lines podcast. Give us one preferred play this week, one name, Rocket Mortgage Classic. Who do you like? And this is going to sound lame, but I think I'm going to stay on the web train. I, I like that Webb got to take a week off. He's a family guy, so I think him being around his family for the last week was probably a good thing for him. And again, I'm a huge fan of him on Ross courses. So week off, he's not as tired as Bryson. Uh, he's getting, you know, what, 12, 15, depending on where you shop him. Throw 10 bucks on him and enjoy the profit. Do it. I like it. There he is, Ryan Boulanger. Boulanger. Is it French? Boulanger? No. <laughs> <laughs> Follow him on Twitter at Ryan Boulanger. And then you can go sign up for his website. How do we do that? Where do we go? So go to thegolfnewsnet.com, look up uh, – fantasy and betting on the homepage or right on the menu and sign up for GNM plus five bucks a month, $50 a year, your choice. But uh, it's a pretty slick deal for modeling and some tools and a whole bunch of other good fun stuff too. Sweet. Thanks for coming on the preferred lines podcast. Good luck this week and your gambling and good luck with your golf game today. Well, thank you. Appreciate you having me on. Okay. Right. Bring in the heat. heat. I'm bringing a beer tonight. Are you drinking with me tonight? Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. I got you here. Yeah, so I had some difficulties during that interview. I'm sure you'll do a great job editing it. But uh, my phone was overheating, so you carry, we carried on, though. We had a great time. He was awesome. Um, great guy. Extremely knowledgeable, like, not only about golf betting, but just about the industry and media in general. So, freaking sweet to have him on. Uh, we'd love to have him back anytime. What would you think? Awesome. I mean, I learned a lot. It was good to have an architect on on a week before uh, Donald Ross and then after a Pete die. It was awesome. Yeah, it was sweet. He was good. So, Cheers, buddy. Bring in the blue check mark. Respect to the pot. Verified, baby. <laughs> That's what happens when you hit back-to-back winners. Hey, if you're new here and you don't know who we are, we're Joe and Chad. We're just buddies. We're talking golf. We do this every Monday night. You're on iTunes or YouTube. You can like, subscribe, comment, all those good things. We're trying to make this up as we go along. We're having fun doing it. We're not real people. We're not experts. We're not touts. We're simply looking at the board together, trying to create some fun, doing a little side action here and there. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. You, I, we're one and one, so we're even on the side action. But, uh, yeah, back-to-back winners feels good. But like you said, we're just having fun. Uh, even today, like, like it's Monday, right? So we're going to go through the board. We'll kind of let you eavesdrop in on our thoughts. But nothing's finalized right now. Uh, I'm not, I don't have a ton of stuff locked and loaded. Uh, we'll get to that further along in the week. Uh, but like you said, you know, we've got so many, there's so many factors, right? Especially with this COVID stuff and all the withdrawals we saw last week, who knows uh, how much different the field is going to look like come Thursday morning. True. Cause I was all in on Brooks and then I couldn't be all in on Brooks and I just 
went with DJ last week. Yeah. And so I was in go. the Monday, dude. I'm up like 80 bucks in three weeks. This is great. I barely ever win at DFS. So like actually winning some money back on this, on these bets is great. You're crushing it, man. You're doing great. You know, you would be doing better though, if you didn't, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, but if you didn't hedge, like after every three holes of live competition, you'd be doing a lot better. I saw what you happens run is I get a little tipsy on the Saturday night and I look at the I board. Know, I'm like, you're home alone. I know, I know what happens when you're home alone on the weekends and all of a sudden you've got 18 guys to win the tournament, but Dude, I'm learning. I'm learning. Okay. I know, I know, I know, I know. those 100 to 1 shots, they're, they're there because the book wants you to give them a dollar. It's like, <laughs> fine. I won't do that. But anymore. congrats. Nonetheless, uh, let's keep it moving. Rock it. Yeah, let's crack classic. open let's the go. betting board. Let's make the turn here on the pod. And that's what we do is we make a, we bring on a real guest, someone who actually knows things. And then you have to listen to us talk about our opinions, which yeah, is what it is. But here we go. We are looking at, but book and things have changed since this morning when i was preparing for the pod and uh printing off the odds here but at the top not much has changed there bryson 625 6.25 to one that's weird but that's bryson for you <laughs> yeah had a weird field and then you got webb enough guy that just withdrew but one before the week that he withdrew and then hatton almost won one before we went into the quarantine. So you got some real studs mm -hmm. at the top of the board. Are you doing anything with these guys? You know, I'll be honest. I wanted to, I wanted to bet Webb coming into this week. I was a little disappointed. The field wasn't a little better. Look, he loves Donald Ross courses. Yeah. He's arguably got the best form on the PGA tour right now, but 11 to one is, is, is a lot to swallow for not a lot of payout. Like I'm not going to sit here and put down $150 on web. Um, I have a number of mine. That I've said it before that I like to win each week. And in order to hit that on web, I'd have to pretty much bet him and like one or two other guys, which just isn't as fun. Right. Well, Ryan um, likes him. Ryan does like him and, and he has good reason to, um, if you look at the stats and like I said, he loves Donald Ross courses He's putted extremely well. You have Sedgefield as a good comp to this course, which I've seen a lot of people use. He's got like three seconds there. Uh, he's playing extremely well. Look, there's nothing. There's, there's no knock against Webb. It's just I don't like the bad guys 11 to 1. Right. So let's get off of this teen section where you have Decky and Reed as well. Uh, but you got the 20s where we've been living and making some money. And this yes. week you got Sung JM right there, 20 to 1 with Victor Alvin. Tony Finau was 33 to one when I printed this sheet this morning and now he's dropped 25 to one. I got my 33 on Tony baby. And then you got Ricky Fowler. You got, uh, well, nah, is 33, but so let's just do those, those four. M okay. Hovland, Finau, Fowler. What do you think? Um, I've got some thoughts here. Look, I like, I wanted to, I, the same thing with Victor Hovland, right? I had him circled. I wanted to bet him coming into this week. I was actually hoping for a little bit stronger of a field um, and maybe just with his number, just because I feel like he's so good. The, the, if When he clicks, the field's not going to matter, right? Uh, but 20 to one is tough as well. Decky's interesting to me here at 18. He checks out really well. He had that missed cut a couple weeks ago, but to me, that's, uh, that's not too worrisome for me. We saw Webb miss a cut. We saw DJ struggle before winning. Uh, we see this kind of stuff happen. We know what kind of player he is. He's probably the third best player in this field, and he's like fifth on the odds board, which is kind of unique. But yeah. I think there could be some value there. Um, Ricky, I, so here's the thing, right? I, I was on Ricky coming in. He changed up his putting grip. Did you see this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Why? Why, bro? He's one of the best putters on the PGA Tour. He People rant and rave about his putting stroke nonstop, about how smooth it is, and he's going to take that and try and change it up. Since doing that, he's lost strokes putting in both events. You go back the last calendar year, he lost strokes putting in two events over the last year. He never <laughs> does that. Two, two weeks in a row, like, I hope to see him go back. I root for Ricky, but I'm not taking him here. I'm off Finau, too. I'm, I may take Victor Hovland, but – uh, I have not yet. Uh, what do you got? You got your boy Sungjae, right? You have That's to. an auto bet. I feel like I'm kind of – I'm not sure if I'm going to do that every week, like an auto bet, but I feel like it just – it jumps out at me. And, like, I make – it make, you know, two bucks on a, a 20 to one. I'll do it just to cover kind of my ass for that week. And I can't mm -hmm. not have an M bet, especially knowing who he is. So, I'm all in on M. But, okay, Finau. 
I think it's it's due. Okay, we talked about this on the. I mean, every pod so far. It's kind of like my <laughs> DJ for the last few weeks. I got Fino again. Uh, this time I put him at thirty. I got him at thirty three or something like that, and he's at twenty five. So people are also on him. I guess looks like. <clears throat> and I don't know. I feel like it's like the time is now and he's motivated after last week's miscut I feel like this is a decent number for this field I haven't lost enough money on Fino over the last few years like maybe other people have so I'm still I'm still going to the well I can't blame you look it's it's hard for me to not be scorned by him and just seeing <laughs> betting him over years and years and I shouldn't be right because each week is its own week he sets up perfectly for it. Uh, he's long, he's straight, he hits good iron shots, but it's just, I can't bet Tony. Well, he's going to have out. to putt well. It's going to have to be that week. For he's going to have so. to putt well, uh, especially in a course like this. Look, it's going to be a birdie fest. It's probably going to be another event where we're around 20 under par. It's oh, kind of yeah, crazy. I was going that... to say to you, this, <laughs> this is like a 25 under week. Dude, especially these courses in the past, courses that actually have played uh, historically somewhat tough coming into the event are still coming in like 18, 20 under par. So we're a little bit weaker field this week, granted. Uh, they grew the rough up a little bit. I saw our guy Colt put out to try and make it uh, a little more penal for those guys who are a little wayward off the tee. That said, it's bomb and gouge week. It's Donald Ross. You get on the correct level. You give yourself an uphill putt, and we're going to see 22 under par. Okay, are we going to see 2200 from the 40 range to, you know, 60 or so? Here we go. We got some names. Watson, Doc Redman. Oh, gosh, we got to talk about Doc. But then you got JT Poston there at 40. You got Hadwin now at 50 with uh, Snedeker's now moved to 50. I got a 66 on Snedeker this morning. So I think the Ben Coley uh, tweet with his photo just changes the market. <laughs> uh, so Snedeker's at 50 now, EVR 50, Day at 50, and Sabatini. Kind of weird range, really. Right. There's a lot of people on Sneds. I took him early morning when they first dropped. I actually got a 75 on him. But, you know, Damn. it's like this book that we're, we're talking starts with a B, ends with an auto. We've talked about it before. <laughs> they're like – they're pissing me off, man, because it's like – look, it's like that kid when you show up and you play golf with every Saturday and he beats you eight out of ten times – but you have a little bit of a run on him, right? You went, you won like the last time out, and then he shows up at the course. He's like, let me get three aside, right? <laughs> They're like a little boy showing up that's like a – take the took their beating, took their punch to the head with Webb and DJ, and now they're just going to sucker all these odds in there. Uh, wow. It's pretty weak. But I've got Sned 75 to 1. Everybody's on him, which worries me. I saw right. that afterwards. But here's the same thing, right? Everybody was on Webb. Everybody was on DJ. So could it be three weeks in a row? It would normally put me off. But listen, we got to talk about Doc Redman here. We right. can't just brush over this. My guy, 250 to 1, 300 to 1 the past two weeks. They slice him down to 45. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever seen that drastic of a drop of a guy, yeah. from a guy who finished 11th the prior week. Um, I think they got had on some of the top 10, top 20 markets. Look, he is so dialed in right now with his irons, with his wedges. Uh, he's number one in approach, number one in opportunities gained. Is he going to make enough putts to win? I root for Doc, but I don't want it to happen here selfishly because I'm not going to bet him at 45 more. Dude, Joe, we've been doing this long enough to know number one strokes gain approach guy. Fire with his irons. The community is behind. Group think has now stifled your creativity to think past what could possibly happen. You don't think Doc Redman himself is reading the news about himself and then he's aware? I mean, are you fucking kidding me? His buddy's like, you're 40 to 1 now. They're texting him. There's no possible way Doc's not aware. Okay, so right. you think Doc's going to show up and have the same jovial, no-pressure attitude he's had the last couple of weeks where he's been firing at pins because he's 200 to 1 having fun? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Tight butthole this week, baby. This is not going to be good for, for Hovland or uh, for whatever his name is. He might miss the cut. No, I, I honestly do think that he'll play well. I'm just not going to – look, he's he's not 45-1 to 1 Doc Redman. I love the guy. Can't bet him there. There is another guy in this range that I have put in a bet on, and that's 66-1 to 1 on Lucas Glover. Guy, okay. I'm never typically on Lucas Glover. Um, he's made the cut, played pretty well three straight weeks, I believe top 25 in there. Decent history here. Look, there's just not a lot of great players in this range. So I saw a 66. I'm on what Lucas Glover. 
There's great players. They're right there. They're right there. Okay, you got Post. Who is it? JT Poston. I got a bet on him. I wanted Harris English. I was going <laughs> to use English as one of my bets. Then he withdrew from the COVID. So right there, around the same number, 40 to 1, Poston. A guy that likes Donald Ross. He wanted to win them. Bet Poston. Okay. And then you're talking about no talent. Well, he hasn't had much talent recently, but he's Jason Day at Donald Ross, 50 to 1. Something's up with Jason Day, man. I can't bet him right now. Look, I was a huge – during his ascent, this is like before I was even like on the Brooks train. My buddies will tell you um, I used to love Jason Day. It, he's just – God, I don't know what to do. He's, he's half in. He's half out. He's not playing well. He's putting terribly. He might have COVID. He might not have COVID. Now he's in this like wet – so he's, he's going to get like double tested for COVID, potentially pull out of the tournament. Then he's going to play in this little Wednesday event that oh, they God, announced yeah. today, the day before. <laughs> it's like, what is the PGA Tour doing? I just got to – I just got to – You know what I'm hoping for is that he withdraws from that thing because that's what he does is he withdraws from like a pro-am or something special that he's supposed to do. And anytime mm-hmm. he does that, everybody thinks that there's a cause for concern and he'll go on to win. <laughs> We'll see. I'm out of Jason today. I, I immediately, I've got a. Uh, but what about last week? You were on him last week, but you like the I was. I was. I was. He was 100 to 1 last week. He barely squeaked through the cut. He didn't do shit really on the weekend. Yeah. I'm out. What about the Euro boys that are here? EVR, kind of a Euro guy, but a gopher, golden gopher. Eric Van Ruyen, yeah. 50 to 1. And then you've got Christian Bazudenhut, 66 to 1. Any interest in the Euro dudes? I don't really have a strong take on either of them. Uh, I've seen some love on Van Ruin. Um, I just don't really, to be honest with you, follow enough Euro Tour to know where they're, where, where, what courses set up well for them, what don't, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses. I'm not going to bet them. Well, all I know is from experience following EVR as a former Golden Gopher class of 2007, aged myself there, but same time, uh, Sky Yuma, go Gophers. Yeah. EVR is a sniper. He's a pin seeker. He goes at pins and he like loves and thrives on that approach game. I don't know if he's much of a grind or a birdie fest guy. He's more of a grinder course guy, 11, 12 under guy than a 25 under guy. So that's why he's here at 50, even though he's top 30 in the world or whatever his ranking in the world is. Don't necessarily take that for real, Mm -hmm. but Bazunahood at 66, no one's betting him, and I'd prefer that. So it looks like they've moved. They were both at 66, and now EVR's at 50. So if you're going to choose anything, just be, like, getting the 16 points goes with Bazunahood. Yeah, these guys tend to – all right, here's my thing on the Euro guys. Many of them, I, I kind of unfairly lump them into this category where they come in, they have a little bit of a run on the PGA Tour leading up. Their numbers plummet. They never really get that win, and then all of a sudden they're waving. Look at – um like Lucas Beregard, right? Oh my God. They were, these guys fit into that Lucas Beregard mold for me. That may be an unfair take, but Beregard all of a sudden came in like a year and a half ago, played well at the match play, played well at one other event, was down to 50 to 60 to one. Now you look, you've got to go on the freaking page three of the odds board to yeah. find him. He's down there at 250, 301. I don't even know if he's playing this week, but that's where he usually sits. We used to love him on the Fantasy Golf Pod because he's beer guard. And we yeah, beer guard, beer guard, right. But yeah, and then no, I I, mean, I don't follow him anymore because he sucks. Yeah. But anyway, all right, let's talk about the long shots, should we? Yeah, let's talk about long shots. Which would consider, you know, 101 and higher usually, typically. Mm-hmm. Just trying to get some real money for some low amount of stakes. <laughs> yeah, speaking of, this is part of the reason why I was a little fired up about the book because I wanted and I should have bet Harold Varner the third at a hundred to one this morning. You now they chopped him down to sixty six. I did not. Um, oh wow, cool! I got him at a hundred. Did you get him? Yeah. Good shit, man. I'm glad somebody got him. I got him for a dollar. I think I don't. I want I, I want him to FOMO, win so man. bad. I want him to win so bad. I really hope he does well this week. I can't bet him at sixty six to one. Um, there's a couple guys here that have sort of piqued my interest. I, I kind of look back at my picks from last year. I was really high on Brian Stewart. Okay. Uh, coming into this event and I, I saw like my tweets firing off during the week that he must have been playing really well and like striping it I know he's kind of a hometown guy he's up there at 110 to 1 Matt Wolf scares me just lingering here in this 100 to 1 range he's looking at his buddies of- he's looking at 
yeah. Hoblin at 20, M at 20. He's even seeing Doc at 40. He's 100 oh to God. 1. I know. Wolf? Does this course kind of look like maybe it's just the the overheads that I'm seeing, but does it kind of look like the 3M a little Correct, bit? Correct, dude. Yeah, that's like yeah. why they put them back to back, I think, last year. Is it? I, I'm telling you, like, it's a green, uh, fluffy. Yeah. Fa- like, they're going to say, we were going to grow the rough up. Dude, you could grow the rough up for a week, two weeks, and it wouldn't fucking matter. <laughs> it's that fluff. If you're strong enough, it doesn't matter. Wolf yeah, is strong. He's strong enough. He's young enough. He is as far as uh, anybody except maybe Bryson, right? Um, so he, he won he the kind of long drive in that here. thing with Fowler, remember? Oh, it was like 380 or something. He went off the tee. Yeah, that he bombed thing. it. Another guy oh, I'm kind of interested in, I saw your tweet earlier today about just guys' um, ability to come back to the same event and play mm-hmm. well. How about Nate Lashley? I know he's uh, been pretty poor, but he's at 125 to one. Got a little bit in- interest in him. Wyndham Clark. Well, you know we like Nate Lashley because his family died in that plane crash when he was in college, and then oh, he I did was not also know this. They, yeah. So he was his family flew to see him play with his girlfriend in a private plane. He oh, does well. Shit. They go by, and then he that plane takes off, crash the whole fucking family, and his girlfriend died. This is like that's terrible. He's 20. So he's thinking, I'm not going to play golf again in my life. I don't care about golf. And so he, he quits. Guess what he does? He becomes a real estate agent. Your wheelhouse, buddy. I know. That's why we were on him forever. And last year at this time, <laughs> I was probably crying. Also, because I couldn't bet him or use him on DraftKings, and he got the win because yeah. he was late to add to the field. But anyway, yeah. Hold anyway, on. I got Ashley. one more guy. Problem with Lashley, though. The, okay, so I follow Lashley just real quick, and he does withdraw randomly out of nowhere. He's kind of like a loser. Is he? Just, okay. Just be careful. Yeah. I don't follow him closely enough. I, I talked real quickly about Wyndham Clark. I'm kind of looking at him at 151, but I did. The only guy that I've actually taken here so far, a little bit random, is Tyler Duncan. Um, okay. Three straight made cuts. He's <laughs> laughing at me. He's like, let me hear this. But, uh, <laughs> well, three straight like, I made used him cuts. against Cecil last week. In did you? Yeah. Um, no, look, like he, he was in this event. A couple of my uh, buddies were talking to me about They They played this event at the Players um, during the oh, – right. Uh, pandemic and they had it was like a two-day event and there were a ton of PG like the field was incredible uh Duncan won that he's now made three straight cuts um he's accurate off the tee look he rated out really well in my fantasy national model in terms of driving accuracy approach off the tee tee to green he was like top 10 in all four of those places it's a bit of a random play here but I'm gonna take a stab at 150 to one tee dunks baby Best part about this dude is that he hasn't putted well. Right. He's doing it putt well. Like, he really is, truly. So, that's what I was hoping he would do in round three and round four, and he kind of didn't. He paid me off a little bit, but at the same time, I'm on to Tim Duncan. <laughs> uh, no, what else did I like in this range? I mean, it's hard to pick now on a Monday night, so we'll see. Yeah. I mean, Siwoo, I've heard because – Donald Ross, he won something five years ago. Oh, Maverick McNeely is a sneaky top 10 bet because he's mm. young. He's unassuming. Right. I like Maverick McNeely. He's talented. What's his odds? 125. See, he was in like the 60 range here not too long ago. Uh, people are betting Wesley Bryan. Did you see that? All right. So here's another guy kind of in that Wesley Bryan mold. I hit a crazy ticket on him last week, 25 to 1 on a top 20 bet this guy paid. 25 to 1 on a top 20 bet. Yeah, 20? I'm repeating it again. It's Ryan Armour. It's the Ohio State Buckeye himself. Oh, uh, yeah. He's back in this event, made cut last year. When Dude, you touted that, putter, didn't you, last week? On the I pod? did, yeah. He, yeah. He, was on, he was on the pod. He was on lunch drive, long shots. Dude, I, I, was I was like, like oh, there's Armour. no way in hell is what my – thought process was and then he finished i used uh, him in round four showdown he made seven birdies in a row or something when he gets hot with the putter he's incredible and he's like uh jim furick light where he hits in ches Revy. he hits every single fairway um his course may be a little long for him but it's really not because it's it's the par 72 right so it's a little bit longer than the past couple of weeks but you have those couple extra par fives two three shot holes for him but he's great with a pitching wedge if he can keep that putter rolling um midwest guy why not nice. buckeyes fare pretty well in michigan over the last couple of years <laughs> wow oh my god <laughs> drama well i'm a first-hand w- witness to that as a big 10 guy so yeah you're right um <clears throat> dude 
it's hard to get a guy who even who's been playing well because you're looking at recent form typically when you want to look at things that the books aren't keen on and they're, they're just too smart mm-hmm. like you said the books are knowing these things so obviously you know we prefer long shots be in good form but you're not gonna get them as long shots if they're in good form hence redmond at 40 to 1 right now so that's why you gotta look right. at guys that are out of form a little bit but in a hundred run range wolf for example someone that can find form in, in a moment's notice like mm-hmm. the guy doesn't have kids at home bothering him. We <laughs> can't do podcasts. They're crying right now. Based <laughs> on my experience, it's extensive experience, Joe. I've been doing this now for three weeks with you. <laughs> but again, I've been doing it a long time, really, though. I'm 35. Uh, I think you can wait on some of the riskier names. Even try to look at after round one, what is going on? After round two, don't be afraid to take DJ on a Saturday night at or Friday night at 80 to one or a Saturday night at 20 to one or whatever you could get, you know, it wasn't, I know he was, no, he was available at a hundred to one after Thursday. Um, I put out a little thing was like, who, who's going to be the community bet. And some dude uh, replied, like I'm on DJ and kind of got roasted a little bit. I completely overlooked him. Um, I was like, he can't make enough putts. Switching putters three times in three <laughs> weeks is borderline insane. If you talk to any golfer, of Dude, course, normal it works golfers. for Dustin Johnson. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. Of course, it works for him. <laughs> He's unfazed by anything, right? He was like two inches out of bounds. Then he's got his foot in the water and he gets up and down for par. Like, um, the guy's unflappable. It show what kind – he's got closing ability, which I love about DJ, right? That 18th hole was was clutch. <laughs> totally. It just turns good for his brain him, off. man. Just switch. Right, back. good for but him. But so just – what we're trying to say here is, like, don't, like, throw a ton of money at the 100 to 1 range. Just get yourself a couple of hedge spots in case of emergency or in case of craziness, you know, or whatever. But live in that 20 to 30 range. Hope that the favorites, people like Bryson, struggle during round one. And you can yeah. maybe pile on or you can maybe hedge yourself – after round one, if you're into yeah. that, maybe leave a little bit of money on the table. We talked to uh, Ryan about that. So just maybe go yeah. with that. Hope the books sleep on a guy that you think will pop and you can add him to your card after round one. Who are you going to add to your card today as a preferred play, Joe? Okay. So I've got right now, here's what I got in. I've got Snedeker 75 to one, Glover 66 to one, Duncan 150 to one, and I'm going to take Ryan Armour. I'm um, also probably going to bet Vic Hovland. I'm just not there quite yet. One of the things in this 20 to 40 range that I kind of touched on and we've talked about a little bit, speaking of the live betting, if you got to check your guys' tee time, right? True. Because a lot of these times, especially on birdie fest like this, if you've got a later tee time on Thursday, it many times pays to kind of hold. In this 20 to 40 range, you see a guy come out with an 8 a.m. tee time and post a 7 or 8 under. Sometimes you can catch an extra 5 or 6 points before the guy even tees off on Thursday. So pay attention to that, especially now that live betting is pretty much readily available on every book. Love it. Great idea. Who do you got? I have him. Like I said, I got Tony okay. Fee now. Oh, I guess I got Tony at 28 to 1. So I'm the sucker. I didn't get 30. But whatever. Tony at 28 to 1. He's going to win 28. And it's not – terrible in this field post in 40 day at 50 i went day i don't know why but i did it so okay and then i'm snedeker guy and wolf guy as of now i'm also like wolf bet a dozen people guy because i don't care i'm doing this for fun joe i'm hedging myself to yeah. get to the next week what's your goals we talk about this at the fantasy golf pod figure out your goals and then just do whatever makes you happy have fun what the fuck do whatever makes you happy. That doesn't just apply to betting on golf. That's a life lesson right there from Chad. Thank Eckert. you. Good job. Thank you. Okay. iTunes review people. If you've reviewed, which we appreciate you because I don't know, it might help or make us look more legitimate. Uh, we are going to give you a towel because we're going to decide who deserves one. Based yeah, on- I'm going to send I'm going to send him a DFS open swag bag too. Let's just fucking load them up. Huh? Awesome. Okay. So yeah. there's a couple guys who, who posted today. So we could do one from the guys that posted today, and there's a couple people that posted from days ago. Um, okay. How do, how, now, how do we want to pick who gets well, it? Is it ran- this one guy already won. I mean, this guy, he's got P P P P P P P P U G. So like pup, pug, and then a bunch of letters. I don't know. This might be hard to give this guy the towel because he's going to have to – Watch this and then DM. Him. Uh, anyway, he wrote, I follow Joe and Chad for a while, and I, they talk about, you know, these are 
talk about two great guys. <laughs> These guys are really smart when it comes to the PGA and strategy for betting. Don't place a bet or submit your lineup without checking the preferred line podcast first. Holy what? shit. Oh. Okay, he so wins. He, yeah, that was a good All right. I already looked through these. Someone's like Dr. Redman, a guy named Doc Redman Fan Club. Yeah, Somebody, I'm in on that, just not at 45 to 1. Get yeah. him back in triple digits, and I'm consider me president. Now, there's a guy named Hall Hall 94 that I know, so I can't give him it, but he loves us, so I like him. But Can we ra- – let's randomize this one. Can I just pick a random one? Sure. I don't know. Do you have your okay. phone up? Or do you no, 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 but you do. So you do the old scroll, and I'll give you a stop. Okay. Let's scroll, 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 scroll. Stop. Oh, my God. Cross, one, nine, one, nine, dude. Charlie? Yeah. You straight up. Atta, babe. I'm so Cross says, big fan of these guys. Big, he, Charlie is a big fan Shocking. of ours. <laughs> I'm shocked. So he deserves a, a towel for sure. Yeah, yeah, we got you, Charlie. Thanks Ooh, for perfect. listening. Awesome. Well, guy with a bunch of peas and whatever that is, pug, hit us up, get a towel, and then Charlie, you win. Thanks for watching. Let's win some money again. 28 to 1 this week. Who do we like? Real quick. Im. No, he's 20. No, oh, Finau is the 28 to 1. Oh, shit. We got Finau. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Back to back to back. Peace. Peace.